Blog Talk Radio. folks and you know what time it is 12:30 means it's progressive conservatism live the hottest intellectual program on the blog talk radio network since 2006 <clears throat> i'm mark radledge your political shrink for the next hour and if you want to be on the show today uh you can call in at 646-915-8862 that's again, that's 646 915 8862, or you can instant message me, as some people are currently doing right now, at M A R K K I N D 1976. That's Mark Kind, M A R K K I N D 1976. That's AOL Instant Messenger. We've got a pretty, pretty, pretty good show for you today. Lots of good stuff. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to do another. In a thousand words or less segment, this time on Smoking Joe Biden, and the Reverend John will be here to lay it all down for us. We will be talking about an article that I read uh, on the AP this past week about ha- what's g- happened since welfare was reformed, which I think is interesting. Apparent, uh, according to the AP article, though there are less people on welfare, there are more people taking part in um, programs to help them out, such as food stamps, Medicaid, what have you, so there aren't less people without need, is the point of the article. And I actually want to address a few emails I've gotten since I wrote my article on that, entitled, On Welfare and the Alternatives, which you can find at markradledge.com. We have another edition of Conspiracy or Quack, which will be fantastic, and this time we're going to take a look at whether or not James Cameron really did find Jesus' tomb. So that'll be exciting. All of that plus the report today on Progressive Conservatism Live. And if it seems like I'm rushing through my intro, I am because there's just a bunch of things I want to tell you. And I want to get right to it today. I don't want to waste any time. So this past week, I was at a training, or as I told Fifi, a school for adults, I'm trying to explain to her you know, why I have to go to so many meetings throughout the day and go to trainings and what they are. So I, so I was at school. And not, not something I hadn't been to before. I've been to enough trainings in my history as a social worker that uh, there isn't much that I haven't been exposed to at this point. But it's always good to go out and meet people and network, and sometimes you get, you know, just just to see if what you're doing is is, is still what everyone else is doing, and there is some sort of consistency in the field. It's nice. It's always it's also always good to get out of the office. They started with a, a cultural. Uh, exercise, which is before anyone spoke to each other, you had to come in, write your name, your favorite book, favorite food, uh, your uh, hero, um, and some other things. A culture gram is what it's called. You had to write these on, on a list on a big piece of uh, paper that was hanging up on the wall. And of course, you know, the first one on there, other than my name, was what's your favorite book? And I had, and I, I had a tough time choosing between. Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, and The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark. So I ended up putting them both. What are they going to do, throw me out? I noticed there were other people on there. Uh, one of them was really funny, actually. Uh, so a bunch of people, including myself, put their hero as Jesus, because you can't go wrong there, especially in a room full of social workers. So 
I'm noticing what other people are choosing for books, and actually there was a person in there whose favorite book was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, so I sought her out immediately to go talk to her. And there were some other ones. So I kept going. So do, during the breaks, I kept... I have... Um, I kept playing the... Uh, rather... Sorry, I just got an instant message. I got... I was looking at the board. Ah, that's the part of the story I was up to. I was looking at the board, I was looking at the books, and someone walked up to me and they said, did you write this? And she points to the rise of Christianity. And I said, yes, I did. So she was like, what's it about? And I explained to her what it's about. And if you listened to the show two weeks ago, you know what it's about, so I ain't going through it again. But I explained it to her, and, and this is the point of my story right here. Her first question to me after she picked up that I was fairly spiritual um, and that I had taken to Christianity as sort of my way of establishing a moral anchor, she then says to me, what do you think about gays in the Christian church, any one of the Christian churches? Now, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where somebody asks you a pretty loaded question based on uh, religion and social mores, and because you don't want to offend anyone, you have no idea what to say. She's asking me my opinion on gays and Christianity, and I'm like, well, I got a 50-50 shot of getting this right. She, she's either going to be pro-gay and religion because she's a social worker and social workers are just liberal like that, or she's going to be anti-gay because she's more Christian than she's a social worker. Now, someone's going to hear that and go, ah, Christians are not anti – whatever. Folks, I'm trying to make a point here, okay? So understand that I'm not saying all Christians hate gays. Let's move on. So I – I started to do intellectual double speak, which is essentially the art of saying a lot of nothing using very, very big words. And she called me on it. She was like, okay, now say that to me again in layman's terms. I'm like, rats. I kind of thought I confused her enough that we could just drop the subject. And I was really struggling with this because it's not something I think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And this goes to the conversation we've been having on this program about whether or not social issues are going to play a major part in the next election. I'm so policy-oriented that I don't care if Christians, if, if, if the Christian church lets gays in or not. I don't sit around pouring through the Bible looking for ways to exclude people because I think that in and of itself is against what Christianity is all about. I think Christianity is one of the more inclusive religions. If you want exclusive, become a Muslim. You want inclusive, be a Christian. It works well that way. So... For her to sit, so she's sitting there, and, and apparently her, her thing was she felt that the Christian church had become too liberal, that maybe not the, uh, maybe not the Catholic church so much, but some of the other, you know, Lutherans, Protestants, dot, 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 anyone um, who was allowing there to be cr uh, Christian, sorry, gay ministers in the Christian church or people who are gay taking part in, um, in the Christian religion, she felt was wrong. And she started to explain to me why. So now I knew at least where she was coming from. I could, ha I could handle myself in the conversation a bit better. And I think my final answer to her was, you know, again, this is supposed to be an inclusive, it's supposed to be an inclusive religion. You know, anyone that wants to, that, that wants to take on the faith should, uh, should and can. Not to mention the fact that you have a slight problem dealing, I mean, you, you want to talk about abortion or something along those lines, yeah, there are pretty standard ways of looking at it. But there's no concrete answers when it comes to homosexuality. You don't know if it's genetic. You know, if, you're going to, if, if, if you find out that homosexuality is genetic, and then you say, well, hom homosexuals can't be Christians. It's almost like saying black people can't be Christian. You can't help your genetics. You are what you are. Now, some people don't like the whole idea of homosexual, homosexuality being genetic. So what if it's a mental disorder? as it used to be. It used to be part of the dsm 4 as a matter of fact. So we go back to that theory. What if it's, and this is certainly something that comes up a lot when you're dealing with especially uh, sexually abused girls, they end up becoming lesbians. Now, were they always lesbians? And this just kind of brought it out. Are they situational lesbians where because they've been raped or molested, they're rejecting men wholesale? Who knows? Um, but be that as it may, what if it is using a very vague and big term, a mental disorder? Well, then you have the issue of whether or not uh, you want to start saying, well, people with mental disorders, whether it be depression, 
anxiety, attention deficit disorder, what have you, whether or not they are going to be allowed in, um, to worship in the Christian church. See, it's not that easy, and this is the point that I was trying to make to this woman. So if you have any questions on that, if you just want to state your opinion, give me a call at 646-915-8862. All right, really quickly, because I don't have a whole lot of time to get into this particular subject, Al Gore has uh, just won an Oscar for An Inconvenient Truth. No surprise there. Everyone thought it was going to happen. I didn't watch the Oscars because I don't care. And I saw the movie An Inconvenient Truth. I thought it was fine. My feeling is, even if it was a bunch of malarkey or if it's the gospel, it doesn't make a bit of difference as far as you still need to cap greenhouse gases. You still need to... We as a country need to get off of fossil fuels. None of these things change irregardless of Al Gore's position on things. But Matt Drudge, decidedly conservative, uh, cited this from the Tennessee Center for Policy Research, which claims to be an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization committed to achieving a free and more prosperous Tennessee. Yeah, it's a conservative think tank is what it is, folks. And how do you know it's conservative? Well, here's what they say. Um, Gore's mansion, located in the posh Bell Mead area of Nashville, consumes more electricity every month than the average household uses in an entire year. Now, they go on to say that, uh, let's see, the average household in America consumes over 10,000 kilowatts per year. Uh, Gore devoured nearly 220 um, kilowatts, which is more than 20 times the national average. He lives in a mansion. Last time I checked, they're going to use more power than my house, which is a three-bedroom house in Florida. He's living in a mansion with some odd, like 20 some odd rooms. Of course, it's going to use more energy. Someone uh, on one of the radio hosts on the pro, um, in Florida was talking about, well, why didn't he start converting to green sooner? Look, I don't know. I'm not in Gore's head. I think. Bill O'Reilly said it best where he, where he said he was a spoiled rich kid, and sometimes they think, well, why do I have to make changes? No matter how many times conservatives, and this is probably their worst issue because they sound like idiots, no matter how many times we talk about the global warming issue, conservatives will consistently get this wrong because they'll attack the person instead of the problem. They never actually cite in truly independent scientists. They always go after the scientists who's either bought and paid for by the oil companies. And again, you have to you have to do some independent research on your own. A lot of times you will find yes, plenty of conflicting science out there, but that conflicting science is paid for by somebody. Who's paying for it and then make a judgment as to whether or not the science is valid. Now, again, even if Everything Al Gore put in an inconvenient truth is not true. It doesn't mean you don't you continue to live like a pig. This is what I don't understand about conservatives. They're also decidedly Christian. Christianity, last I checked, is about constraining oneself and not conservatives, not in this argument. No, 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 no. Every time you bring up global warming, they throw themselves on the floor like a baby and start whining and crying about how they don't want their SUVs taken from them. And God forbid the person saying that flies on a private plane. Oh, then all of a sudden they don't have any kind of integrity whatsoever. Nothing that they say is true. Give me a break. On this issue, conservatives really need to grow up. The man is talking about changing a fundamental way of thinking, which is that we're going to have X amount of resources ad infinitum. And that's what he's talking about changing. And conservatives, for some odd reason, cannot handle this. So they attack him personally. Well, look, see, do what I say, not as I do. Even if any of that is true, which I really don't think it is, I think this uh, thing by the Tennessee Senate for Policy Research is a bunch of baseless crap. My feeling is that if you want to attack global warming and say it doesn't exist, find me an independent scientist not working for ExxonMobil that's willing to say that and show me proof, and maybe I'll give you some attention. But to continually attack Al Gore, because the conservatives on this one don't have a single leg to stand on, not a solid, valid argument, to me, 
smacks of the very same immaturity that I'm constantly chiding liberals for. Why so on this particular one, you know, if I have to say that I'm far left or whatever else, you know, to just to say where do I stand on it, then well, that's the case because I can't stand with the conservatives on this. And on that note, I want to bring to you at this time, googly, are you ready? The very wonderful, the very cogent, the very politically analytical, the one, the only. Do you have your hand on the button, sir? Please allow me to adjust my pants so that I may dance the good time dance and put the onlookers and innocent bystanders into a trance. got a music recommendation from someone that I actually really enjoyed. Yes. <laughs> and you know, this is one of those situations where if people are going to call up and complain, oh, the music was too long, screw you, it's Clutch. I, I, I'll, I'll throw the whole show out and play Clutch for an hour. Wah, wah. <laughs> What's going on today, John? Um, Not much. Uh, just one, one thing I want to get to quickly, because uh, as I was forgetting a ton of stuff yesterday, I forgot to throw in a plug. I am. I just joined the staff of InsideFights.com covering uh like mixed martial arts and like cool stuff like that. So if you, you have a see... particular show that you cover, don't you? Um well, <laughs> funny you should mention that. Originally I was brought on to cover the Thursday night lineup for UFC lineup for Spike TV that they all just canceled this week. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So right, right now I'm kind of just like roving news until the um Ultimate Fight Night, not Ultimate Fight Night. What the hell? god, they have too many freaking shows. Um inside Ultimate... the UFC. Oh, yeah, The Ultimate Fighter. Until that comes on in April, I'll, I'll just be a roving reporter. But if you go to www.insidefights.com or just go to insidepulse.com and select Inside Fights, you will find me there. Outstanding. Well, it's good to see that you're writing quasi amateurly professional again. <laughs> it's good to tell that you're blogging. So apparently the conservatives don't like Al Gore. Are you kidding? No. It's amazing that they cannot handle this argument whatsoever. And it's funny, I probably would have given this more time, and I went a little long in that first part. But, mm -hmm. I, but this does need a little bit – I do need to say a little bit more on this, and that's yeah, – the, 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 the problem with this whole argument is how – I mean, the, the conservatives, for the most part, through some, through some channel, will, will, you know – and none of them will admit to this, are carrying the water for the oil companies. Now, is it because the oil companies own a lot of their radio stations and papers, or, who, you, know, or, they, or you know, they just know them personally? Who knows? I don't, I, I don't get that deep into it. Or is it just because liberals say A, therefore, therefore they have to say B? Maybe. But I think no matter how many ways you slice it, no matter how much, no matter how much information, how much proof you give these people, they never want to listen to reason on this particular issue. And it makes it very hard to listen to them on any other issue outside, outside of possibly the Iraq War. Yeah, because I mean, it, 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 to me, this is basically an example why conservative radio has no credibility with me. Mm. Because the same people who think Al Gore is a hypocrite and global warming is a conspiracy by the far left to control the global economy are the same people who said that Barack Obama was trained in a madrasa, and the same people who said Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and the same people who said that Alec Baldwin was going to move to Canada. And the same people where, when the Hollywood started raising money for the um, the victims in the New Orleans hurricane, criticized them for it instead of you know giving them a hundred dollars. I think if you want to move away from my idea that that they're all just holding Exxon Mobil's water, is they're all just a bunch of babies. Yeah. You know they're 
just as much as do as I say, not as I do you know, people. In other words, you have a lot of conservatives out there who will present themselves as all shucks, you know, down-home kind of, kind of people. They are, in fact, themselves millionaires, and they don't want their lives to be um, restricted in any way. They want to continue to live like pigs. Now, they're pigs that may not get abortions, but they're pig, you know, and they're pigs that may go to church. But let's face it, these people, their, their argument is, we don't, you know, if you say we don't want to continue polluting the earth, their argument is, how dare you take away my SUV? Well, that's a pig's answer. That's yeah. something a child says. You know, and I, personally, I don't understand why, especially, I can understand if you live in, like, the woods, or if you live, live in, like, the hills, you need an SUV, because you actually do have to drive off-road. But the amount of SUVs, they driving around the highways on Long Island. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it's yeah. damn silly. Because they're, all, they're also the same people who, who complain about gas prices. It's like, get a smaller car then. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. See, this is, and this is what, what, what kills me is conservatives will be the first to tell you that liberals, you know, are a bunch of whiny babies, you know, who don't want anything taken from them, and that's why they fight you on things like the war on terror and whatnot. But how, are, you know, how do conservatives look at themselves in the mirror, you know, and not realize that that is a pot calling the kettle black? Yeah. And I'd like to, you know, and again, I'm very conservative on a lot of issues, but on this one, I look at the conservatives, and I, and I almost have to turn off the radio. You have guys like, you know, Michael Savage, who I don't really want to name drop here, but who who go on two hour rants about how global warming is a myth. <laughs> you have, you know, and just just to move away from the famous personalities for a second. I mean, I'll just talk about people that I know in common conversation in my in real life. They too think global warming is a myth. They don't think that man has any footprint on this planet that any warming and cooling is just part of a natural cycle. And again, it's like there's no room for, for, for both faith and science on your bookshelf. It's, you know, in, in this particular case, the conservatives are just touting faith. They believe that there's no such thing as, as global warming. They believe that it's all, it's all natural cycle, and therefore it must be true. It's like, mm-hmm. but, I, but I can show you the science that you know, it's probably a little from column A and a little from column B. Nope. See, the world is, is flat. This, this is why I, I, I call myself right of moderate as opposed to conservative, because where I have a lot of conservative beliefs, I don't want to be associated with these douchebags. <laughs> because, <laughs> I, no, sir, as, as soon as you say you're a conservative, they, I get, you get like an eye roll, or, you, or you're, you're one of those types. It's like, no, 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 I don't have a radio show. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> oh, okay. But <laughs> outside of that, I'm not getting... Hi, welcome to Progressive Conservatism Live. <laughs> yes, you know... I'm not getting paid to exploit people's ignorance. I just no, want a smaller government. For certain. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think you owe me money. I do? <laughs> you may be. Oh, it's possible. But, you know, I don't care about this crap. I just want a smaller government and be left alone. Yes, you're a libertarian is what it sounds like. Yeah, you know, more and more I'm beginning, I'm beginning to turn into one of those libertarian whack jobs. Mm-hmm. Wait, listen, lo- lower my taxes, keep me safe. Otherwise, I don't want to hear from you. Mm-hmm. Then that's that's the, the view of a lot of people, and I think and I think that's where the conservatives are coming from when they're not acting like infants, and that's essentially they you know they feel that if you can, that if you're going to deal seriously with global warming, then the government has to be a little bit more, more involved in your life. Well, the government, much like the war on drugs, if you didn't do drugs, the government wouldn't have to be involved in your life, and if you'd stop living like a pig, if you'd stop wanting to drive a Abrams tank. To work to your yeah. to your, to McDonald's where you work, if you you know if you go if you if you would learn to do as Jesus said and learn to control yourself and live a somewhat restrained life, then the government wouldn't have to make laws because you're a jackass. Right. You know you you don't need to drive your SUV down the block to pick up milk. No. You could I don't know maybe walk. <laughs> There's a thought. I I miss riding my bike. You know, I actually, I see that that I I used to ride it all the time, but I had got a flat tire, and for, for some reason, gas stations took out their air pumps. <laughs> they took why did the gas stations took out their air pumps in my neighborhood? Why didn't wow? When did this happen? I have no idea. Apparently, this summer. <laughs> <laughs> you think you need to get yourself a bicycle pump? I, that's right. what I'm thinking. It's literally, anywhere within walking distance where I could walk with my bike to fill the tire, so I could I don't know ride it back to my house. All right, John. Joe Biden in a thousand words or less. Go. Smoking Joe Biden. Hit it. Why why is my battery dying so early? I just saw it from the show. Hang on. 
<laughs> Progressive conservatism having technical difficulties. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Progressive Hello? conservatism, we made professional. <laughs> Once again, hit it. Okay, smoking Joe Biden. Uh, I've actually, I've been following him for a while, because whereas I might get accused by people of blindly following Republicans, I've always been a firm believer of the best person for the job, or since this is American politics, the uh, less shitty of the decision. So I've got my short list. I've got McCain and Giuliani, who we've discussed. I've got Bill Richardson from uh, the former governor of New Mexico, which once people start finding out more about, we'll find out that he, as they say in the hood, is just mad qualified. Now, he's a Democrat, yes? Yes. Okay. And then you've got smoking Joe Biden. And there are essentially three points I want to bring up about smoking Joe. Uh, one is his most recent foray in the news, was, which was the... Uh, which was the Barack Obama faux pas, and I, I, I can't get that sound clip so soon. Where uh, <laughs> see, this is why we work well. One of us drops the ball, the other one's right there to pick it up. After he kicks it a few yards. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> but uh, well no. After he he he, he said he said the stupid Barack Obama comment, and unlike the way most public figures handle themselves where they either blame the other person for them making the comment, like John Kerry, or in, or in the case of like Michael Richards or Mel Gibson or anyone else, they get to go into rehab because they don't understand why they say these things. He simply, you know, he took it like a man. He made a mistake. He apologized for it and moved on, and as, and as a result, the story dropped. And I know he gets some criticism for... Well, like, you know, we can't have a president who, who says stupid things all the time. Have you seen who, we have, who we've had for the past six years? So it, it, we kind of lose the, the reason to complain about that. But the main thing that I like about Joe Biden is uh, the war in Iraq. Um, now, I may not I, – I know that there's some, there's some debate over which is more important, social issues or national security and global issues and things like that. And the way I, I always look at it, Grant, you know, I'm not, I'm not as far right as you are. I, you know, I don't think I don't think we're gonna get invaded by China anytime soon. I think Iran is all talk. I'm not. You that say that about now, that. but you're not the one wearing a burqa. Go yeah. ahead, please continue. Okay, but in the event that I'm wrong, I want someone in the White House who, I don't know, may, might actually know know what to do in the you know in the event that I am wrong. And what kills me about most of the other Democrats who are running for the White House is because when it comes to the when it comes to the Iraq War, it's all about taking. Um, excuse me. When it comes to the Iraq War, it's all about you know what the far left wants, which is immediate troop withdrawal, which to me sounds always sounds a little disingenuous because it's not like they want immediate troop withdrawal because it's in America's best interests or because they particularly care as much as they want it. To, because it'll embarrass the president, and they can say we were right, you were wrong, na 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 na. It also their their extreme far left move on dot org um, socialist Cha Guevara base. Yeah. Will also then be satiated. Yeah, and, and but then so uh, you have all the other candidates. It's like an auction, where it's like well one of them says oh I'll, I'll have immediate withdrawal by November of next year. It's like next guy comes on oh, I'll have immediate withdrawal by January of next year, and then you have Dennis Kucinich I'll have immediate withdrawal by last Tuesday. And then Hillary Clinton comes out and says, "I will withdraw the troops before we send them." Yes. <laughs> in the case in the case of Joe Biden, where he's been very critical of the war, but he, he but he's been critical, even though he's been critical, you get the sense that he understands what's going on. He's also slapped him, him and Barbara Boxer have taken turns slapping Condi Rice in the face ever since she became Secretary of State, <laughs> which is fantastic. <laughs> but um. See, when it comes down to it with, with, with the immediate troop withdrawal, he answers a simple two word. He, I mean, he at least asks and is thinking about a simple two word question that comes after that what next? You, we pull all the troops out of Iraq, then what happens? Because, you, you know, we can't, we can't just, you know, bring them back to the troops so we can tackle social, the social issues that the liberals want, and while Iraq gets taken over by Iran and whoever else is around them. And where everyone else is like criticizing everyone else's plan without a- having one of his own, he actually at least you know has a has a plan on his own. And what is that plan, John? That plan is basically is divide Iraq into three states: Kurds, Sunnis, and uh, Shias, right? Yes. Which, uh, which granted wasn't the plan coming in, 
But I think it's going to get, we're going to have to get to the fact, uh, the realization that the Iraqis don't really want democracy. The, the Kurds essentially want to be left alone. Uh, the Sunnis want Saddam Hussein back. And the Shias want a theocracy under Shiite rule. There's only one problem, if you don't mind me saying so, with his plan, and that is if the Kurds declare their own state, we're going to upset the status quo in Turkey because then the Kurds in Turkey are going to want their own state, and then the Turks will be pissed. I'm not, so saying, it's a, problem. I'm not saying it's a perfect plan, mm-hmm. but I'm just saying the, the, the fact that he's at least come up with one. That's other, other than run away? As yeah. Like, <laughs> a la Sir Robin from, from the yeah. Knights of the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but no, fine. He comes up with a plan, so someone else says, "Well, all right, well, this is the idea, but maybe we should change this." Mm-hmm. And then you, you know, you, at least you have a plan to debate, and you see what it comes out with it, as opposed to right. I agree. Know. Joe Biden has actually tossed out something concrete. It's got problems, it's got flaws, but it's it, it's something a little bit more substantial than run away, run exactly. away, brave, brave, Sir Robin. So, um, what else does Joe Biden bring to the table as far as domestic policies? Okay, well. There's one thing that he's – I mean, you can't really say that he's known for it because, you know, people only talk about issues that really aren't all that important. But one of his big things is – Does he the, have any legislation on Anna Nicole? No, no sorry, he does not. However, he does have le- groundbreaking legislation, the Violence Against Women Act. Excellent. What is all that about? Which, which, is, which is what he's known for. Basically, it's increased uh, – so say it's Wikipedia. The Violence Against Women Act – contains a broad array of groundbreaking measures to combat domestic violence and provide billions of dollars in federal funds to address gender-based crimes. So basically, you know, going after rapists and going after, you know, abusive husbands. Um, there's also the, uh, he sponsored the Rave Act, which is going after some of the more designed date rape drugs, like ecstasy and stuff like that. And an issue like this that a candidate actually cares about could sway me to vote for him. You're never going to hear him talking about it because it's it's not pretty enough for the for the media. It doesn't have to do with abortion or gay marriage or the war. And you know, but um, yeah. So he he's got that. That's that's like that's like his big issue. I mean, the the rest of his stuff is basic Democrat slash liberal p- policies that they all have. So a vote for Joe Biden is a vote for splitting Iraq into three into three separate states, and a vote. For protecting women against violence in the home. Yes, and it's a, it's also it's also a vote for if you're if you're really concerned if, if if you're more concerned with social issues and you want to vote Democrat, it's a vote for someone where should you need someone who cares about foreign policy, you're going to have someone who knows what he's talking about. Okay, what are his major flaws? What are I mean, he, everyone's going to bring baggage. The baggage that I know of with him is he plagiarized the paper twenty years ago. Twenty years ago. Uh, um, he did something else that the, the conservatives jumped up and jumped up and down and gave someone pirate eye over. What was it? Do you remember? Um, why are you calling me? <laughs> I'm not. I'm sending you a text message. Okay. Well, my cell phone's all the way downstairs recharging. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do we have a conspiracy or quack theme? Yes or no? Yes, we do. Hot dog. <laughs> I'll play it all. I'll play it all. Since apparently you don't have it in your computer. <laughs> <laughs> Progressive conservatism, we live in front of the curtain. Look, we don't get commercials here, folks. It's not like we have a whole lot of time to plan on the fly. <laughs> like we keep saying, progressive conservatism, we mad professional. <laughs> the T-shirt will be on sale soon. Yeah. All right, well, other, I mean, than pla- other than plagiarizing a paper, what other baggage does he bring to the election? He had one, one controversial comment about Indian Americans where basically – Oh, God, that's right. Where he, where he said if you, come, if you come to Maryland, every, if you walk into a 7-Eleven, you'll be greeted by Apu. I have a great relationship in Delaware. The largest growth in population is Indian Americans moving from India. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm going to go with Joe Biden wasn't making a racist comment there. Joe Biden was trying to, w- w- was trying to make a joke. And I will say – I've got to tell a quick story. I went um, – same training that I was talking about earlier. Okay. A girl was uh, – saying that her, her, her greatest birthday memory was the time that her and her friends decorated their bikes, uh, you know, so-and-so's birthday and rode it around the neighborhood, to, you know, as kind of like a parade thing. And, and like, oh, that, you know, that's cute. And she's like, yeah, I was kind of a dork. And he's like, oh, you were a little kid back then. And she goes, yeah, it was last year, making a joke. Mm-hmm. And we all had to laugh, aha, last year. And I'm like, yeah, you were 30. You want to talk about a girl's face just falling off and hitting the floor and giving me daggers. Nice. Now she's like, I was 22. I was like, I'm 22, and I'm like, I'm making a joke. <laughs> I well, yeah, I, 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 you're younger than that. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess, unfortunately, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of the phony outrage in this country where if you say anything about anything, someone's going to get offended by it and cry. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it may, granted, it may have been a stupid comment. The comment he made about Barack Obama was a stupid comment. We, we all make them. Mm-hmm. We all have foot and mouth syndrome. My wife, myself, John have all been in mixed company and for one reason or another have said things that made us sound foolish or said things that were meant to be a joke and <laughs> and just did not come across that way whatsoever. God, I mean, I remember a football uh, Super Bowl that I was at with my friends where I happened to – just because of where I've grown up and the people I've had as friends drop the N- N-word a lot. Mm-hmm. And I do it as a joke. And my friends all know it's a joke, and, and they understand that I work blue <laughs> when I'm not on the air. Yeah. And I, was, and I was just doing every other word. And one of my friend's girlfriends at the time was just like, wow, he's really a racist. And I had to explain to her, like, no, I'm not a racist. No, You're I'm doing really shtick. Funny. Yes, it's shtick. He was do- Joe Biden was doing shtick, shtick may- which may have prevented him from <laughs> ever running for president, but, you know, shtick nonetheless. Yeah. So one funny thing about um, him calling Barack Obama, saying he's a sharp as a tack, that's the exact same thing that the racist cop called Jay-Z in 99 Problems. <laughs> We're getting an instant message from our good friend Pete that says, no, Mark, that never happens. The hell you say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course not, Pete. <laughs> Oh, I think Pete was there when uh, when I was accused of being a racist. Okay. God, I, I you know, I've said stupid things that I thought of vendettas. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> you've, actually, you've actually had a bounty on your head for the dumb things you've said. <laughs> or, so, been, or, or, or been accused of doing, but we both agreed not to go there. Anything else on Joe Biden? Um, so, sum up. Uh, reasons okay. to vote, reasons not to vote for him. Re- Re, uh, reasons not to vote for Joe Biden is because either John McCain or Rudy Giuliani get the nomination. Uh, reason to vote for Joe Biden, unlike most Democrats, when it comes to foreign policy, he actually knows what he's talking about. All right. And with that, it's time. It's time. It's time. It's chicken time. Okay. Chicken boo, what's the matter with you? You don't act like the other chickens do. You wear a disguise to look like human guys, but you're not a man, you're a chicken boo. You know, it took me a minute before I realized what, whose theme song you were just doing. <laughs> well, I wish we had had Vader's theme song, with just random clucking. <laughs> it's but, our I have, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't have had it on my, uh, on my screen. I would have had to send you a text message. You would have then told me your phone is not with you. <laughs> Because, as we said multiple times, Progressive Conservatism Live, we mad professional. <laughs> the hat will be on sale soon. Now listen, <laughs> worldpoultry.net presents Perfect. Teenage Suicides in Japan Linked to Bird Flu Vaccine. What? what, what? Teenage, uh, this isn't really a funny story. So oh, all right. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's not a lot of shtick here, but I, I, there wasn't much else there, and I thought this was actually pretty interesting. Okay. Teenage suicides in Japan linked to bird flu vaccine. A bird flu vaccine is currently under investigation in Japan after yet another juvenile has committed suicide after taking the drug. This is actually, I've, I've heard of this with other things. Um, they said that there's certain medications for a, a variety of mental diseases that actually will cause you to commit suicide, as they say, or um, well, you know, might, might influence your decision than not treating the mental disorder itself. Mm-hmm. I find kind of fascinating. But uh, the teenager who jumped 11 stories to his death is the 18th fatality in 17 months linked to Tamiflu. Tamiflu is an antiviral drug regarded as the most important shield against bird flu in humans. The Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare asked the Japanese importer of Tamiflu to collect the information about the conditions of patients who take the drug. The drug is only available by prescription. The 14-year-old boy's death follows a similar case two weeks ago when a girl, also 14, died after jumping from an apartment building at Gamagori in central Japan. The Swiss manufacturer, Roche, says that the rate of deaths and psychiatric disturbances among people taking its medication is no higher than for the flu sufferers generally. It denies there's evidence of a direct correlation between the drug, and there's a link here that apparently says otherwise. Okay. Last year, U.S. Food and Drug Administration warned about the dangers of giving children Tamiflu. You know, this is why 
people need to get into the habit of making sure that if they're going to be prescribed medication, they actually do the research first. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have anything else on that, do we? All right, then. Let's talk about welfare. Okay, let's talk about welfare. You ready to talk about welfare? Why do, uh, yeah, let's talk about why we hate poor people. <laughs> we don't hate poor people. We, don't, we, we hate poor people. We, <laughs> this is progressive conservatism. It means we hate poor people. I'll actually get to some of the emails I got on this story in a moment. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I love it when you get emails. Oh, yeah. Um, first, this started with an AP article, Welfare State Growing Despite Overhauls. And the beginning of the article goes like this. Uh, the welfare state is bigger than, dis- than ever, despite a decade of policies designed to wean poor people from public aid. The numbers of families receiving cash benefits from welfare has plummeted since the government imposed time limits on the payment a decade ago, but other programs for poor, including Medicaid, food stamps, and disability benefits, are bursting with new enrollees. Now, basically what that's saying, what happened was when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House and Bill Clinton was in the White House, together they worked on bipartisan legislation um, reforming welfare. Welfare used to be means-tested in the sense that you had to meet certain criteria in order to get it, but anyone could get it if you met that criteria, and it was and it would go on forever. You could stay on welfare for the rest of your life if you wanted to, and there was and it, there was nothing. There's no incentive to get off welfare other than your own not wanting to be on it anymore. Um, under those, if you wanted welfare though, you couldn't be married, couldn't have a husband in the house, which was part of the reason why we have so many broken families today, and you couldn't work which was stupid because many jobs that people who were on welfare needed to get oftentimes were not enough to take care of their house. So wait so a they second. they still needed welfare even if they had been working. Wait a second. If you, if, you're, if you were collecting welfare and you were collecting money from the government, you weren't able to work or do anything to improve your life so you wouldn't have to collect money from the government? Correct. If you got a job, you got kicked off welfare. Hmm. So what the people in the government decided to do – was do welfare to work, do a welfare to work program, which is they made welfare time limited, only five years, and in that time the government would help you get education, get job training, whatever, so that by the time five years came along you got off welfare, which seemed like a good idea at first. What happened is the five, five years has gone by, people get off welfare, but a lot of oftentimes they're no better off than they were before. Maybe they could find work, but it's not work sufficient enough to take care of their family especially if you're living in one of the bigger cities where the cost of living is so much higher than, than salaries, the average like say, salaries for uneducated people or undereducated people. Like, say, Long Island, for example. You know, it's actually a really good point, and that is this is something that I've brought up for the last couple of years in both private conversations and on this radio show and on my blog, which is com, and that is – cost of living continually grows up, goes up, and it goes up exponentially. However, salaries either stagnate and in some cases go down, or if they do go up, they don't go up in relation to the cost of living. Therefore, it, even if you're getting a decent paycheck, you still can't afford to live. Or in some cases, every year when you get your raise, you'll get the standard of living increase. The problem, let's say like if the standard of living goes up you know, 3%, you'll get a 3% raise. The problem is that the standard of living is so so much higher than what you're getting paid it doesn't make much of a difference you just you're you're three percent you're three percent closer to, to just barely scraping by right uh now i have like i said i got a couple of emails which were fascinating first let me talk uh for a moment about what some of the alternatives are and that is i've often said that if you go to uh usbig.org you can actually read about the basic income guarantee which it which solves the problem of I want to work, but I don't have enough money to take care of my home, and I don't know what to do, and so all these other items tend to branch off of that one theme. Mm-hmm. Basic income says that everyone starts at zero, and then, then however how much money you make, we supplement it with, um, you can call it a negative income tax or a basic income guarantee, basically a check from the U.S. Treasury um, based on how much money you make. You know, what's funny is people will then attack me for being a socialist, which I'm not, not by a long stretch. You're a social worker. <laughs> Very close, but not a, not a socialist. American Indians, right, Native Americans, you want to be PC about it. 
Actually, they, 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 they prefer Americans. They were here first. Brown people. Um, Dots are feathers. <laughs> <laughs> I can't continue. Okay. <laughs> if the Let's say the Massapequa tribe of Long Island. Okay. Contrary to popular opinion, is not a bunch of obnoxious Jewish girls. No, it is. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if the Massapequa Indians decide they're going to start a casino, and the casino, because Long Island's got a bunch of depressed gamblers, you know, it just which, blows which up. Which it, be- which it does. I used to play poker with them. Um, blows up and becomes just the greatest casino since Atlantic City. The government then gives them money, sort of, you know, congratulating them for having done well on their own. They supplement their income. This is corporate welfare. There's an, there, was a, there was a long time article, um, and in the sense that it was a long time ago in Time magazine, that said that the better an Indian tribe does with gaining, the more money they get from the government to supplement it. Mm-hmm. They don't need the money, but they get it anyway. However, what if the, um, I don't know, another, another tribe on Long Island, John? We've only got uh, about a million, a million places on Long Island named after Indians. Wantaw. There we go. But the Wantaw Indians can't get themselves a casino and end up uh, needing welfare and have all kinds of alcohol problems. Which they do. The government gives them nothing or next to nothing, you see. No incentive to do better. Yeah. So what I'm telling you is we already have a history in, uh, in this country of giving people who don't need extra money extra money because they've done well and giving the people who need the money nothing. Oh yeah, life, liberty, and doing things that make no that that don't make a lick of sense. Right. So when I talk about the basic income guarantee as a way of getting rid of of just mothballing the welfare system and all of its and all of its subsidiaries such as Medicaid, food stamps, um, what have you, I can't remember the name of the baby one anymore. But uh, WIC, that's it. W I C. Okay. Getting rid of all of those um, social payment programs and just going with a basic income guarantee, which would be a hell of a lot cheaper, it's not like we haven't done that sort of thing before. We do it all the time. We do it with farmers. We give them corporate welfare. We do it with the Indians. And this is not something unheard of. But I know a friend who still lives in New York City who actually um, does work trying to get the child tax credit converted to a caregiver credit. But the child tax credit, you may or may not know, is if you've got a kid, the government gives you um, tax money back or adds to the tax money you already get based on how many children you have. Again, much like welfare, where you would get more per child, the government gives you more money per child that you have, child tax credit. However, what they want in their, their social agenda is that if you take care of an elderly person or, uh, or if a spouse ends up not being able to work and you have to take care of them because they succumb to some sort of medical issue, that you get a caregiver credit in addition to a ta- uh, tax credit, a uh, child, child tax credit. So in other words, it would be extend to everybody that requires care versus just children. This is one step towards possibly getting a basic income guarantee. And this is what she wrote to me. She says, you can't take the AP article at their word. Their analysis is misleading. The reason that welfare costs more than ever is not because people are switching to other programs. It is because the bureaucracy that has been created on top of the existing one to administer forced work programs and child care and to even put more welfare caseworkers on the job of micromanaging poor women has made it more expensive than ever. In other words, because they've got to pay me a salary, that's what costs, that's what costs these programs. The, the trick with the basic income guarantee is that it comes directly out of the Treasury. You don't have to create an extra bureaucracy. I'll give you another example of this. My current job is a case manager for people not currently involved in any other system. They're not involved in foster care. They're not involved with welfare or anything else like that. They're people who might require therapy but don't have the means to get it, respite services but don't might have the means to get it, what have you. Now, rather than just give these people a check and let them spend it uh, according to their own needs, they pay me X amount of dollars per year to go get it for them and to pay the people to do that. So we have to pay the respite workers, we have to pay the therapists, and then you have to pay me to manage all of it rather than, <laughs> rather than just giving them um, an adequate sum of money in order to go do this themselves, which you can make an argument of, well, they're just going to go spend it on crack anyway, but that's a whole other story. 
Which they do, but go ahead. In some cases, and in some cases they actually do what they're supposed to. You're kidding. Yeah, they really do. Um, she goes on, but this this is what I wanted to, the other thing I wanted to read is I got lit up <laughs> by somebody who had all kinds of problems with my article that I wrote on this. On the topic of welfare for, um, when I said welfare for a very long time was not means tested and that in many cases it did encourage a breakdown of the family unit, he says, so under the basic income guarantee, the plan, the people currently working for minimum wage could all quit their jobs and sit at home, and their quality of life would would stay the, and their quality of life would stay the same. Meanwhile, people in the middle class who bothered to study and go to college can be tax blind to pay for this. No, you wouldn't be tax blind. There's a whole operation at work that keeps the taxes relatively the same. And the other thing about this, that argument is, in America, believe it or not, John. People, really? actually, people actually do want to work. They do want to get up and do something. Okay. So while some people may take the opportunity to take the money and run and sit home, most people will continue to work just for the satisfaction of working. They may change to do work that doesn't pay as much because now they have a supplemental income, but they're not just going – most people are just not going to sit home and do nothing, believe it or not. So that's my first problem with what this guy writes. And again – this isn't typical welfare where, where the rich, rich are taxed to p- feed the poor. This is, there's an in, and I don't quite remember how it works, but, again, if you go to usbig.org, it explains the way the tax system will work in such case that it doesn't overly tax anybody. Um, I love when people say, this is what he writes, I love when people say they can't afford to live on their own because it's somehow mandatory to own multiple computers, cell phones, drink $4 coffee, eat out all the time, and otherwise piss away money. The very notion of a budget is lost on most people today, and the solution isn't to redistribute wealth by raising my taxes and handing out yuppie welfare. I'm wondering if this is Rush Limbaugh who wrote this to me. Um, okay, here's, here's what I'm wondering. I really don't think the people, the people who need the welfare, the basic income tax credit, are spending $4 on coffee. No, in most cases they're not. And if that's the case, then no, they shouldn't get the check. <laughs> No, in most cases, the reality, I mean, the, the, the image that you got from the 80s of, of the, uh, the Cadillac driving welfare mom or whatever, the welfare queens, I think is what Rush Limbaugh called them, uh, it's just it's not true. I actually work with poor people. They do need help in, in managing. And, yeah, you can, you can sort of equate it to sometimes making bad decisions. But I think if we're going to start holding the bar at if you make a bad decision, then no one's going to help you, boy, is this world going to be a lot worse off. Yeah, I mean, the, the people he's describing are your basic middle-class people who are completely irresponsible with their money that, that they have. What mm-hmm. you're talking about is the people who can't, who, who can't afford to have that money to be irresponsible with it. And he says, as for daycare, people need to raise their own damn kids. It isn't cheap, so maybe getting educated, getting a decent job, and getting your life grounded should actually be prerequisites to having children. Oh, wait, that will require thinking more than five minutes ahead in unreasonable demand today. It's not that I disagree with that. But that's my argument for why I don't like abortion either. I do think people should think and restrain themselves and, and, and control their behavior. But they don't. So this guy's solution apparently is to shoot them because they're obviously not worth helping. Well, as far as this guy is concerned. Anybody care what this guy thinks? All right. <laughs> you got anything else on this? Um, no, nah, nah, I just hate poor people. <laughs> okay. In the interest of time and shtick, we want to present to you the next segment, which actually has a theme song. It does. Welcome back, Conspiracy or Quack. Shoot him now! Shoot him now! (laughs) Jesus tomb found, says filmmaker. (laughs) <laughs> Google it, keep, it, keep your sign to yourself Alright, alright, alright Jesus had a son named Judah And was buried alongside Mary Magdalene According to a new documentary By Terminator director James Cameron Okay, the guy that brought you Terminator Now brings you Jesus The film examines a tomb Near Jerusalem in 1980 Which producers say belonged to Jesus And his family Speaking in New York, the Oscar-winning Titanic director said, statistical tests and DNA analysis back this view. But Mr. Cameron's claim has been attacked by archaeologists and theologians as unfounded. Gee, you think? 
<laughs> Maybe a little. Um, archaeologists say that the burial cave was probably that of a Jewish family with similar names to that of Jesus. But, but, but wait a second. <laughs> if, if, if science says that Jesus was an savior, that means Christianity is wrong. Apparently. Of course, he says something, he says something uh, a little bit different than that. This goes on. Okay. Mr. Cameron said the combination of names found in the tomb convinced him of their heritage. See, this is what, this is what it says on the tomb. Uh, according to the is, is, Israeli, oh, thank you. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, six of those coffins were marked with the names Mary, Matthew, Jesua, son of Joseph, Mary, Jopha, Joseph, Jesus' brother, and Judah, son of Jesua. You know, I've got like three or four people in my family all named Sebastian and Michael. Yeah. Wait, so, <laughs> So, so, so that means your cousin Sebastian is really our savior? I think so. Uh, another grave said by the producers of to be Mary Magdalene convinced researchers of the truth of their find. Mr. Cameron said in a New York conference, unveiling this documentary, The Lost Tomb of Jesus, Mr. Cameron said the chances of finding that combination of names together was like finding a grave marked Ringo next to the others marked John, Paul, and George. Glad he's somehow attributing this to the Beatles. Uh, you, you know what kills me about this? What kills you about this? People who don't believe Jesus existed and will make it a point to tell you that they don't think Jesus existed, any, any chance they get, now all of a sudden believe that Jesus existed just because now they have quote-unquote scientific evidence to attack you for being a Christian. Right. But prior to the Da Vinci Code, you had people running around who said Jesus didn't exist, and then, and then you have all this stuff coming about how that may discredit the traditional view of Christianity – now, forgetting that Jesus didn't exist in the first place, saying he did exist, but ha, he's this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. There's, the, there's a line in here that I wanted to read you before I start tearing this to pieces. Okay. Um, ah. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay. According to James Cameron, uh, they said the discovery of the tomb does not undermine the key Christian belief that Jesus was resurrected three days after his death. That's fantastic. Look, the only reason why James Cameron's doing this is to refute the traditional view of Christianity and undermine it so that people will hopefully walk away from it and, I don't know, become secularists, live like pigs, drive an SUV, and punch a baby in the face. That's, yeah, more uh, or less. I, I'm fairly certain that was what James Cameron was going after here. Yeah. You know, ne ne never, ne never mind the fact that 70% of the country believes in Jesus in some form or the other, and the other 30% produce movies and make up the liberal blogosphere. I mean, you're talking about a group of people, just to sort of take this from the other, the other tact, you're talking about a group of people who think humanity, despite oodles and oodles of evidence that evolution exists, that we did, in fact, evolve from apes and chimpanzees, these are the same people that no matter how many times you present them with scientific evidence and pull skeletons out of the ground that show you that this is where we came from, will tell you that they don't believe it, that humanity existed, that humanity was created 10,000 years ago by God in the Garden of Eden. So exactly what is he, you know, he, it, my father, who is decidedly atheist, sent this to me, and he said, you know, it'll never be proven, and if it is, nobody will believe it. And I think that sums it up. But you have here a guy who, who, while it doesn't say it in the article, clearly is trying to show that, see, if I can prove that Jesus was buried and he did not ascend and therefore Christianity shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying by that leap in logic, does this also disprove the Holocaust? Well, yeah, because there, 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 are, there are scientists and scholars who say that the Holocaust was exaggerated. There are also scientists and scholars who say that global warming is a myth. And there are scientists and scholars who say that certain, mi certain minority groups are genetically dumber than white people. Right. Let me ask you a question. Does the, does, if he can prove that Jesus did not ascend into heaven and that they found his body in a grave buried with Mary Magdalene, does that, prove that, does that also disprove that we went to the moon? Not to mention the fact, how exactly do, do, you, do, you, do you prove this? I mean, Jesus has been dead for... Uh, 2008 minus 33 years, <laughs> and the guy who directed Titanic is the one who discovered his tomb. No, according to this, actually, he just he just ran the film on it. But uh, this was actually found by Israeli construction workers building an apartment complex. 
Wait a second. So, uh, hang on. Um, yeah, I'll read to the line. Israeli construction workers building an apartment complex in Jerusalem's East Talpiat district first uncovered 10 of the 2,000-year-old ossuaries. 2,000-year-old? He would have died at 8 years old then, if that's right. I'm sorry, in the tomb in a tomb in uh, in March of 1980. So this was 2000 year old 1980 give or take of uh, I don't think he would have been dead yet. So let me, let me get this straight. Jesus was born in yes. theory. Uh Mary ma- married Mary Magdalene, had a couple kids, uh was crucified, was put in a tomb. 2000 years later someone's building building a condo, <laughs> discovers something that says Jesus. And that disproves that he he ascended into heaven. Yes, and that there was no Holocaust, that white people are smarter than black people and have bigger brains, we didn't land on the moon, that LBJ did in fact shoot JFK. But you no, know, but if if you say all those things, then 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 you're a racist and you're an, an, an anti-Semite. Really, this is interesting. So if I say those things, I'm a racist. But if I say Christianity doesn't really exist. Well, yeah, I mean, you see, I mean, that, that, that's, you're allowed to say things about Christians and Catholics that you can't say about anyone else. I mean, just ask John Edwards. <laughs> or as Ann Coulter called him, the faggot. <laughs> oh, Ann Coulter. <laughs> She's hot and retarded. Uh, and she also hates America, but whatever. <laughs> All right. Um, next week on the show, we're going to talk about stuff. We're going to talk about uh, well, Actually, let, 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 let's discuss that stuff. I was thinking we might want to talk about the Newt gingrich Mario Cuomo debate. Hang on, I think we're off the air. Hang on one sec. Because I just got an email that said a little warning before you go off the air next time. I, oh, <laughs> so I'm wondering, did we go off the air? Um, I don't know. I still hear you. <laughs> I still hear you. Interesting. Who who sent you that email? Pete. Oh, okay. Maybe um, I don't even know. <laughs> so okay. I, we could be talking right now. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, you know what you do? Play the end credit music and I'll call you on my cell phone. That sounds fantastic. Bye. Bye.